you had a very interesting line, be open to pursuits where the budget does not exist. And that that's very counterintuitive perhaps, but but in my view, it it resonates in the sense that something I have been arguing at Digenomica a long time against a lot of the models I see for the modern buyer is that in many cases, you don't know when the buyer is really buying or not. And that's why establishing trust with subject matter experts and people who control budgets all the time matters because you don't know when they're going to shift into a buying cycle. And you kind of hit on that as well. One of your slides that you were kind of referring to just now around help provide content. So how do you do that, right? How do you reach people? You can't be going to shows all the time. Yes, you try to do that, but content can be a very valuable way to start building that trust in a, in a virtual way. And so you went through a bunch of interesting categories of content that vendors can provide, including thought leadership content, which is something obviously we feel strongly about at Digenomica. Uh, but you also have things like value assessment tools and case studies. And, and to your point, videos a bit lower down than some might expect. Yeah. I mean, when, when we think about it, in order to make a purchase decision, we kind of simplify it. Um, and, and we have a few layers of complexity of this that we take with customers. But we always think to make a buying decision, first, I got to make a case for change. Why should I change? And often the why change, particularly in those ad hoc purchases where they aren't budget, are things, maybe things they haven't been thinking about, but they should. Right. And, and that's really where thought leadership comes in, whether it's thought leadership you create or thought leadership from third parties that help them see things from a different perspective. In the world of challenger sale that our colleagues from CEB now Gartner created, they called it commercial insight. But the whole idea was to take an idea and acknowledge how we currently think about things and then expose something they're missing that causes them to think different. And we do believe that if I cause people to think different, that invites the discussion to say, hey, maybe we should be doing this instead of that. That provokes conversations within the company. That causes them to reach out to vendors. That causes them to reach out and say, hey, we need to learn more about this. Should this be something that we're doing? And so thought leadership actually rose to the top of our list of one of the most important types. And again, if I think about the buying committee and I have all these different people, Many of the people are only on it occasionally. They're not in all the meetings. And I got to reinforce constantly that this is something we should be doing instead of other stuff. And thought leadership helps with that. The other ones, when we look at things like value assessment, and case studies has always been at the top of the list, right? And we can argue the value of case studies because I, you know, I think everyone wants them and most people hate them because a lot of them don't ever get to the details. It's something that right. you talk about. And yeah. that those type of case studies actually are very closely to the idea of value assessment and implementation tools. And that is once I've made the case for change, I want to understand what it's going to take to actually be successful and what is it relevant to me. Mm -hmm. Valued assessment tools fall in a category of things we also call buyer enablement, where I can actually put some data about my company on it. So I can do a diagnostic to say how big a problem is this for me? And I can share that with the buying team. I can do calculators, maybe not full ROI calculators, because it's hard to believe a vendor ROI calculator that skips half the things that I really have to pay for. Right. Um, but I can create calculators that help them quantify things to some extent. Implementation guides highlight, what's it going to take for me to move from my current state to the future? And frankly, case studies that actually tell that story of how people achieved it are incredibly valuable. Yeah, we need the thing that says so-and-so got so ROI and this much process improvement and others. But people look at those things and say, that's cool, but I don't see how we'd ever make that type of thing happen in our company because no, you know, we got this legacy data, we got this mismatch. You got to tell those stories. And if you tell those stories, that'll help you win the deal. Yeah. All the same, I was struck by uh, when you had this list of the things providers could do to make buying easier, you had something of like a word map and responsiveness was the biggest one. And I was like, responsiveness, really? <laughs> like, we haven't figured that one out yet. But you said here that when buying teams ask for information like pricing or clarifications, you should be able to get it. And it sounds simple, but it actually doesn't happen as, as easily as it should. Um, your respondents told you that the inability to get specific product or implementation details from vendors was the second most likely cause of significant delays. Now, that's kind of mind boggling to me, actually, but I guess it is. Well, and again, I, I think it's mind-boggling, but then when we put in the context of this desire 
for control in a situation that we can't control, I think that's what contributes to it, right? Because they're asking for details and we look at and say, that's hard. And we look at that and say, oh, well, those details are going to reveal that everything's not 100% rosy. Well, get over it. We all know what things aren't 100% rosy, right? Again, buyers aren't stupid in terms of that. They know these things are hard. But give them what they need because part of it is if they ask for it, one is clarify how fast do you need it, right? That's part of the response in this is recognize the time. And then the more you sugarcoat it or try and hide it or conceal it or make it difficult, that's just lowering confidence in you. That's lowering confidence in themselves. And this isn't a game, right? I I think we got to stop thinking of this as a game. This is something that we need to work together to win. And, And if you're not a good partner, that's a bad sign. Right. And and I think what's being missed here is that it's not just about resolving to do better as a vendor and seeing some opportunities to follow through more rigorously. I think there's a deeper culture change going on. When I when I go back a couple of decades, I remember when, you know, big year multi-year ERP deals got closed on the golf course and uh, or other places that of of less repute. Um <laughs> But but it was it was all about your ability to schmooze. That was the core um, sales capability in many cases. And the market has changed so much. And what I would my my sort of preach to vendors is salespeople need to be much more like advisors now, uh, and marketers need to be more like educators and journalists instead of being so obsessed with hyper personalization, which is not wrong to be obsessed with that, but it's not enough. And um, to me, those are really big cultural changes for for vendors. And I just don't see many vendors clicking with that yet. So it's going to be interesting to see if some of your data uh, jolts them into awareness of these things. But we shall see. Well, and it's particularly important for vendors that aren't leaders, right? Because one of the the things that was interesting in terms of getting attention, right, there's still, despite all this, and I think it plays to why we still have significant project failures, um, we still, those habits are hard to break. I mean, we do this study every 18 months in some variation, we're going to do it more frequent and we don't see sea change in terms of behavior on either side. Um, it's very rare to see that. But buyers said the thing that got their attention was a vendor that was pre-approved to work with them and a vendor whose name they recognize was some mm. of the things that caused them to start to learn. Sure. So that recognition and and it's almost that perceived level of, I'm not even going to say trust, but um, I kind of get what I'm getting still leads to people influences decisions significantly yep. because it's kind of the devil we know. And if, if I'm not in that group, I got to break free by being different. And I think those that be different by embracing this partnership approach, helping people get different perspectives, being very open, right? Could you imagine a vendor that says, You know, the best way to get an answer about this is go to this user group and ask this question. And guess what? You're going to get some people that are very unhappy with us, but many of them are going to tell you how they work through it. That's how you're going to learn. And to be open to say, trust our customers and challenge it, pretty interesting. Um, Yep. And, and, And you do make a good point. I mean, there's still, there's still a lot of incumbent power in, in enterprise software decisions. And I don't, I don't mean to imply that that's all been disrupted. I've kind of, I'm kind of looking ahead as much as I am speaking to today's uh, purchasing process. But, uh, but I do think in general that vendors are a lot better at selling digital transformation than they are at doing it themselves. And that's <laughs> something they do need, need to take a look at. For um, sure. But uh, <laughs> I, I do want to uh, close in a few minutes with, with some advice for, for customers. We've hit on a little bit about this, but I do want to, Get, bring it back to to what customers can do with some of this information. But before we do that, or were there any other kind of surprises or or big things that jumped out at you from this that that we haven't touched on yet? It, well, and customers, we got a few different ones. I, a couple things that I was thinking about that brought up. One is you mentioned the delays, and we talked about the inability being the second most. You know, the biggest was addressing security concerns, and. Yeah. This plays to the idea that many times customers don't know how to buy because we had 65% say security concerns caused delays, either significant or moderate, but only 29% of those respondents said their security group was even involved in the project. Um, And so there's another opportunity, and this could be one of the biggest for the savvy vendor, 
And that mm-hmm. is to collect best practices of how your customers bought that were successful, right? And you can look at successful and they had a successful project, but also they bought quickly. There weren't a lot of delays. So it's good for you too. And start sharing those with customers, right? We know that in this category, every other customer of your size has always had to take this to the security team. And we've had to share information. We've prepared a packet and a conversation guy for you to start that discussion now so your project doesn't get the surprise, right? We don't see that being done consistently. That's an opportunity. So one thing is you can teach your customers how to buy. And again, that's sort of that partnership approach. Um, yep. And then I wanted to riff in a totally different direction because you talked about, we talked briefly about advocacy and we talked about this idea of control. Right. I had a client request a call with me. I actually refused the call because what they asked me is, what can I do to make my customers write good reviews for me on our site, Peer Insights or G2 Crowd or whatever? Mm. And my answer was, have a good product and help them be successful. And that was not the answer they were looking for. So we still have this idea, this fear of, oh, I have these review sites, but I'm trying to control the conversation. And the more I control, the worse it's going to be. So I'd keep that in mind too. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because every show I go to now, just about there's going to be a booth vendor set up to get folks to write impromptu reviews. And it's usually attached to some type of reward, some prize they might get. or um, and, and it seems to be very much a volume game, uh, you know, positive reviews. And I find that really disappointing because to me, these peer review sites, and I've had dialogue with a couple of them about this, is customers are looking for credible and thoughtful reviews, not, not just, yep. you know, fanboy fangirl reviews. And, yep. you know, you see that even on Amazon, right? When you're purchasing something for Absolutely. a reason, you're not looking, you're, what you're looking for is the people that know their stuff. And even if they, they might criticize in certain ways, but you might say, Hey, you know, this person criticized that, uh, that this, this movie doesn't have a commentary track or something, but maybe you don't need that. Right. So it's not right. like that criticism was devastating for you. But the fact that they were willing to say some things that weren't completely positive adds so much credibility, right? And and to me, the peer review sites are going to get into a lot of trouble if they don't make sure that that it, that it doesn't become kind of a volume game. So yeah, I'd have to let the Gardner folks talk, but we do a lot on that, and it's you know a lot of acknowledgement. What's the incentive, right? And right. and in, incentives for time are fine as long as you acknowledge that incentives for positive reviews are frankly illegal. <laughs> so, um, exactly. So getting back to, to customers, I want to just talk with you a little bit about uh, what, what, what customers and, and slash buyers can kind of take, take away from this. Uh, one of the things I think we hit on is that it, it's so important to, to build out your, your so-called networks of, of experts and people you trust inside and outside of your, your company and to maintain those throughout your project. I mean, um, obviously, you know, I, it's in my self-interest and perhaps yours for us to say that since we are perhaps part of that trust network. But the thing that I see at shows that really blows me away the most is when I'm like just at a lunch and I'm hanging out, maybe the customer's asking me a couple questions, that's fine. But then the, they shift to each other and they just start sharing stories, right? Yep. And here's what's working for me. Oh, wait, have you tried this? To, have you asked them about this feature? Oh, you should really ask your salesperson about this. And then the conversation takes off. And I'm like, wow, um, that to me is is the gold. And, 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 and buyers who are able to get involved in those conversations through their user groups or conferences or online or what have you, I think have a huge leg up. And, and I do understand that, that a lot of individuals, you know, for either for corporate culture reasons or for time reasons, don't have the time to, to invest as much in that. Or maybe they see it as a celebrity game. They don't want to become speakers and show circuit, uh, you know, heroes. Fine. But, but I still think that to me is, is the biggest thing is that you're going to need perspective on what you're doing because the, the stakes are always changing. And, you know, you could be in the middle of a project and, and a company gets acquired and you're going to want to know immediately how that impacts what you're doing and be able to reach out to people to quickly understand that. And, and, and you're not going to want to take the word of just your prime vendor and, and just your, your, your big SI. You're going to want other people you can turn to. So to me, that's number one. Yeah. I, um, you know, what, and 
and it's this idea of, of circles, right? Because right. one of the things that we saw, and I, I, this is a directional opinion versus something that's strongly reinforced by data. But again, the folks that were having a high quality deal were more likely to involve multiple departments as formal members of the buying team, right? They were more likely to have security involved. They involved procurement versus avoided them. They had um, corporate IT and and we're seeing a growing thing. I'll probably be talking about this soon, a business unit IT. They had both of them involved, right? And and it's, again, if, if if I can establish my objectives, right? That's the the goal. Then getting different opinions on that can help. And then as you take it outside to influencers, right? I talk about influencers all the time and I constantly have to say, we're one of them. Without a doubt, we're one of them. But if anyone thinks we're the only one, they're probably misguided as well, mm-hmm. right? And including ourselves, if, if we think we're the only one. You need different perspectives and different perspectives for different questions in the buying process. And customers and peers can bring that to you. The idea that it takes longer and I don't have time and I don't want to do that, I think is another one of these paradoxes in this world because I end up taking longer in all likelihood if I don't leverage them because I, I, it's harder for me to deconflict information. It's harder for me to build confidence. But if I go at it willy-nilly and don't have those objectives to shape it, that's when I run the risk of it being unending. So if I form objectives, Recognize I want different perspectives from within my company, from independent stuff, from peers. That could be interesting. And peers, it might even be more interesting that it's not necessarily peers in financial services or peers in um, similar size companies. It's peers by companies that think about technology like we do, which would be a segue to another discussion around the enterprise technology adoption profiles, but we can save that for another time. Yeah, definitely. We'll probably... Uh, when I looked at this, I was like, yeah, we could do probably five co- podcasts on this, but that might take a little while given Gartner's media approval process. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to stick with this one for now. Ouch. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, Hank. <laughs> uh, but uh, I did want to mention that you wrote a post on this topic just very recently. You called it integrating different perspectives. And, and I think it's important to bring up here. Uh, you were referring specifically towards um, integrating um with across teams, but I think you could apply it to this conversation as a whole. And you raise a very important point here, which is once you talk about extending your your network and extending projects into into, into a deeper consensus, you say, but isn't there a risk here? We also see challenges achieving consensus and managing. Broad involvement could also derail projects, right? Definitely. And I think that's an important point to acknowledge that that what, what we're advocating here can make things more difficult. But the rest of your post goes on to talk about how those risks can be managed. And I won't go into all of that here, but you may want to comment briefly just on the fact that, yeah, you can manage the risks of, of integrating more perspectives as well. You just need a plan to do it. Yeah, and it's just shaping the decision-making process. Uh, I think you wrote about and you talked to the guys from Clover Pop at one point who have done some interesting thing with decision practices. Um, but again, it starts with this is what we're trying to achieve. What do you think about it? And, and what's the thing that we should be thinking about instead, right? Versus if you make it too open-ended, then you're you're not getting to where you want. And that, that shaping it is fair. Um, one of the things, and, and you see this less with land and expand, but I think for some horizontal solutions, right? It's the idea of, well, if we can get multiple teams involved, right, it's easier to make the business case and they can share the expense. But many times whenever I had a solution that was like that, what I guaranteed is that I had a bunch of people that say, I'd love to use this, but I don't want to pay for it. <laughs> um, so it's being thoughtful about it as well that could start to play into that. And it's knowing what you're looking for. And am I looking for someone else to tell me this is a good idea? Or am I looking for some validation that, there's a path that I can do this. And I recognize those trust in use. And and maybe it's best, again, as a vendor, not for me to create that content, but let's find third parties that really like exploring the details of how stuff gets done and point people to that because that adds credibility to it as well. Yeah, definitely. And and I think uh, something else that you had raised that ties into a lot of this is is just 
is you know, on both sides that the customers should judge vendors on their totality because a lot of times these are multi-year partnerships to try to extract a better outcome or value or whatever you want to say about that. That includes things like judging the caliber of your support and your sales experiences. All those things factor in and that goes both ways, right? So now vendors are accountable to that too. And so they have to provide that experience across the different ways that they engage. In. And as you point out, those vendor interactions are very important. And just because there's no longer control there doesn't mean that the customers aren't going to factor those in very, very heavily. So that's, I think, where I would leave this. Yeah. And I mean, I may throw out, like you may see us at some point talk about the idea of continuous customer experiences just to continue that. Continuum. There you go. But it very much relates to that. And, and um, you know, it, and it is, I got to stop thinking of handoffs as I'm a vendor, right? We've built models that are based on handoffs. MQL to sales accepted lead, to sales qualified lead, to deal, to customer success team. And we have these discrete elements. Customers don't care about that, right? And frankly, half the stuff that customer success is doing are things that if I bring forward into the buying process, I'm actually giving people confidence they can succeed. And it is that stuff like implementation guides, and it is the details of how. And that's what gets them to win. And if, 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 if I can stop thinking of handoffs internally and recognize that customers don't care, then I can start delivering those types of experiences that people are looking for. No doubt. Well, we made it through the whole thing without you bringing up magic quadrants or me saying something snarky about them, which is pretty cool, uh, Hank. It's really nice to have that type of dialogue. I, I applaud you and your team at, at Gardner and Gardner in general for being willing to engage with Diginomica because obviously we go about things differently, but I'd like to think in the end we have the same goals in mind. So it's nice to be able to reach across like this and do this. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I mean, it, it, that's part of that whole PR approval process kind of flowed into that last part of the discussion, but I, it is true. I mean, you know, there's so much need for tech, right? But there's so much need for us, everyone in it to be better. Right. right. And, and if the, that idea of being complacent about half our projects failing to meet objectives and saying, we're okay with that. I don't think anyone should be okay with that. Right. right? And, and, and yeah. that's what we got to get past. Yeah. We talked about that on the Diginomica side too, like how, cause we're kind of a media analyst hybrid, but we're always like, how can we be better too? Because like you said, the, the reality of a lot of failed projects and, and, and just the reality that technology hasn't solved all of this, right? And so we all, like you said, have to have to do a better job to get these projects across the finish line in a way that more customers can feel good about. Otherwise, why are we doing this? Right. You right. Know? And let's let's learn from that, right? There, yep. you know, failures are failures are never simple answers. It's it's very rarely the vendor fault or the customer fault or right. the product fault. It's a combination of a bunch of things, right? It takes a lot, right? Let's figure out how to minimize that, right? And 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 let's mitigate past that. And and if we're thoughtful and acknowledge that these things happen, right? We can do things like you know pre mortem is my current buzz of the day, and that is let's ex let's talk about what failure would look like. And use that to say, well, what can we do different so it doesn't happen, right? Let's do those things. That's going to help us get better. Works for me. All right, Hank, thanks for the dialogue. Appreciate your time today. Awesome, man. Take care.